Hello, I'm Doug, and welcome to the Crew of Japan podcast, a weekly podcast where we take you on audio journeys through Japanese culture. This time on Crew of Japan podcast. Welcome back to our podcast. In the past, we've spent a lot of time talking about different avenues to make your way for an extended period of time to Japan. We've gone the route of discussing working in Japan while mostly highlighting teaching opportunities, be it private schools, a kaiwa, or the JET program. And we've also, whenever we've had the chance, both Jen and I have always advocated for studying abroad if the opportunity is available to you. But what about getting the funding to pursue a long term educational opportunity in Japan? Well, depending on your situation, you may be eligible to pursue one of Japan's Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, or to make it all short, MEX, scholarships. There are a few separate programs and options to consider when exploring these MEX scholarships, and it's crucial to know and understand exactly what you're looking to get out of this program, what's expected of you as an applicant, and the justification for receiving this grant money. It really is a lot to consider, but that's where we'd like to try and help. Today, we're joined by not just one, but two guests. First up at bat, the crew sits back down with a familiar face slash voice on the podcast, Ty Ebel. For those of you who may have caught our previous JET episodes, you may remember Ty as the JET coordinator for the Consulate General of Japan in Nashville. In addition to that, Ty also wears the hat of MEXT Scholarship Coordinator, and he's graciously joined us today to talk about the MEXT Scholarship programs, what to expect and just some general advice on the application process. Following that conversation, I sit down with William Archambault, a New Orleanian, friend of the podcast, and most importantly, a current MEX research scholar in Osaka. Willie joins us to talk about his experiences during the application cycle, his current research, and life as a MEX scholar. Whether you're neck deep in the application process already, or maybe hearing about MEX for the first time, each conversation offers invaluable insights into the intricacies of the MEX scholarship application process, some tips and lessons learned along the way, and hopefully some clarity on whether or not these MEX scholarship programs are the right scholarship program for you. So Ty, you're up. Let's go. Here's what's going on with Japan Society in New Orleans. Be sure to check the show notes for links and more information. Here we go. On Saturday, May 11th, Japan Club of New Orleans is hosting its annual crawfish boil at 12.30 p.m. on the lakefront. And Japan Society of New Orleans is invited. Registration is required to purchase wristbands, and wristbands are limited. If you'd like to attend, please sign up by the end of the day, Sunday, May 5th, on the Japan Society website to secure your spot. On Thursday, May 16th, Japan Society of New Orleans will be holding a free screening of the Akira Kurosawa Classic, Yojimbo, at Market Place in their incredible courtyard space. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. and screening starts at 7. You're welcome to bring your own outside food to the venue and cash bar will be open to purchase beverages. All ages are welcome. Bring a friend. For more information and details about these events and future events, follow us on the website and social media. Everything will be linked out in the show notes. Hope to see you there. So today we have with us Ty Ebel from the, oh my God, I butchered this every time. The Nashville Consulate General of Japan. <laughs> <laughs> the Consulate General of Japan in Nashville, right? That's, uh, yes, that's, a that's official the official title. title? Okay, my dyslexia went. <laughs> I'm going to leave that in there as is. I don't even care. <laughs> We have Ty back with us. If you've listened to our podcast before, we had Ty on a couple times for jet program related episodes. And today we're going to do something a little bit different, but I want to welcome Ty back. And obviously Jennifer too. Are you here, Jennifer? Always here. <laughs> but I want to welcome Ty back, not only to the podcast, but back to the States because he just got back from Japan on it looked like a pretty cool trip. So welcome back, Ty. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I spent uh, 10 days over there. Got to catch up with all my my old friends from the jet days. So it was, it was nice. a lot of fun. Excellent. Excellent. So like I just mentioned, you know, people may recognize your voice from our JET program episodes that we've had, and maybe they met you in person at like Japan Fest or maybe some of the school visits when you're doing the recruitment for JET. But today's episode is going to tackle something separate, a separate program from JET, but it's still Japanese government run. What we're referring to is the MEX scholarship programs. At a high level, could you give us an idea of what those are? Yeah, so they're basically, they're scholarships offered by the Ministry of Education, MEXT is the acronym for it, M-E-X-T, that allows international students from around the world to go study over in Japan. There are, I think, six different MEXT scholarships, but there are only four that are offered here in the States. There's a scholarship for high school students to apply to, to go to a, a technical or vocational school in Japan. 
that high school students can apply to to go get an undergraduate degree in Japan. Current Japanese majors in college. So I don't think it would apply to anyone in Louisiana because there aren't any Japanese majors, but anyone listening to this as majoring in Japanese could go spend a year doing intensive language and cultural training in Japan as part of their college experience. And then the final one and the one that we spend the most Americans on um, is a postgraduate scholarship that would allow you to go to Japan to get a master's degree or a PhD. Yeah, our friend of the podcast, Doug, I don't know if you know this, but Loretta or Kimuchi-chan, she actually did the MEX scholarship and she did it for postgraduate. Oh, that's right. I completely forgot she had done that. So, yep, okay. Yeah, she did. I do remember now that you say that, I remember her mentioning that dinner episode. <laughs> <laughs> but so this is for people who aren't going to college in the U.S., but they have to apply to a college in Japan. Is that correct? Or am I missing something? Well, it depends on the scholarship. Mm. And I guess it'd probably be best to focus on on the two that we get the most applications for, which is the undergraduate scholarship and the research scholarship. Sure. Gotcha. The undergraduate is for someone who generally doesn't have a bachelor's degree yet, but wants to get a bachelor's degree. And for whatever reason, wants to get that bachelor's degree in Japan. Gotcha. Whereas the research scholarship is for someone who already has the bachelor's degree and is wanting to get an advanced degree. And again, for whatever reason, that they want to go to Japan to do that. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. And in both cases, the scholarship basically covers your flight over to Japan, a living stipend that varies by scholarship, but you know, s- somewhere in the round of about a thousand bucks a month, a tuition waiver from the school that you're going to, so you don't have to pay tuition. And then those are the main benefits of all, all the scholarships. So you're getting a little bit of a living stipend, you're getting to go to school for free, um, and you're getting your flight over to Japan and then your flight home at the end covered. Okay. Nice. The undergraduate one that you had mentioned, that's for the full four years, right? Or is it an additional, like, I think if I remember correctly, there's an additional like kind of add on for language at the front end or back end or something like that. You could either apply for a direct placement in which you're going for a full four years, or you can do a, an initial kind of training 10 month period. Uh, so it's more like a, a five year scholarship, um, in which case you would go to a, a language school for the first oh, cool. couple semesters before going into the undergraduate degree. That's kind of cool that you can focus on your Japanese language before you actually are diving deep into the actual undergraduate program. So that's kind of cool. In terms of the timelines for the application process until the start of the program, you know, I know that this year's application, I believe is May 24th, right? Yeah. So that's the deadline that our office has set. Okay. One of the quirks of the the MEC scholarship program. So for those that are familiar with JET, you could apply through any consulate or the embassy anywhere in the U.S. Oh, okay. For MEXT, you have to have residents in the jurisdiction that you're applying through. Uh, so in Nashville's case, we have obviously Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Kentucky in our jurisdiction. So you need to either be a student who's going to a school within that region or your parents, you know, you have to have a permanent address in that region to, to apply through us. Oh, okay. And every office sets a slightly different date. So I think the, the deadlines, depending where in the country you are, anywhere between May 14th and May 24th this year. Got it. Got it. Um, and that is the deadline to submit a physical application. So you have to print everything off. You got to get all the application components. And oh. if anyone's interested, look it up online to, to get the list of the components. <laughs> it doesn't take too long to put an application together. The main things that you got to get are the transcript and then letter of reference. And those can take some time. But the rest of it, you can do yourself in, in a day pretty easily. So it's not like the JET application used to be where you had to print everything off and then go collect all these different little tiny pieces here, there and everywhere and then put it together in a FedEx file that's like, you know, an inch thick and then mail it off. It, I mean, it's basically like that, but there are fewer <laughs> things that you have to do. <laughs> so in terms of the timeline of the application period, once once people submit their applications, how long is it before they hear back on the results? It's going to depend on the the office you're applying through. But here in Nashville, typically within about a week, sometimes two weeks, uh, we'll get in contact with all the applicants and let them know whether they'll be invited to sit the exams and the interview. Okay. The interviews for the last several years we've been doing remotely, typically over Zoom or Teams. Um, The exams, though, you have to take in-house. So anyone who's taking a scholarship that requires the exam, you would need to physically come to the consulate that you're applying through in order to take that exam or set of exams. And is the exam just like a standardized test or something like that? Or is it specialized in something? 
it's modeled after the exams that Japanese students would take for entrance exams to universities. Gotcha. Okay. And that's for both the research grant program for like your master's and or PhD, depending on what you're going to research or mm -hmm. the undergraduate program. So for both, they have an exam. Yes. Okay. There's a lot of layers of complexity to it, but basically <laughs> the, the undergraduates, everyone's going to have to take an English, a Japanese and a math exam. The math exam itself is particularly difficult. And so I always encourage folks on our website, we've got a link to like examples of past exams. And, you know, I always have folks who confident they're like, oh, I'm valedictorian. I took AP calculus. I can handle the math exam. And then they come <laughs> in and they get like a zero or maybe two points out of a hundred on it. They get maybe one question, right? So it is Japanese math is a lot more extreme, I would say, than, than kind of the math that we're learning here in the States. And you're not allowed to use a calculator or anything during the exam. Ooh. So it, it really is quite tough. And then if you're looking into more of a STEM field, there's an even harder math exam that you have to take, um, as well as some science exams that are also quite tricky. For the undergraduate scholarship, it really is the the exams are that that's the hurdle that you got to jump over. Um, and you know we can't recommend someone unless they perform well on those on those exams. Um, gotcha. So there are very few Americans that we send on the undergraduate scholarship. <laughs> but a couple of years ago, I did send someone, so it is possible. But you just mentioned like you don't bring a lot of undergraduates with a scholarship, but you didn't mention anything about the postgrad. So I'm assuming a lot of postgrad candidates do pass this test. For the postgrads, because they're coming from America, they don't need to take the English exam. They're exempt from that. None of them have to take the math exam. So the only exam that they may have to take is the Japanese. Japanese. And this year they made a slight change to the rules. On the research application, you can indicate whether you intend to take coursework in Japanese, in English, or in Japanese and English. And if you're only looking to take your coursework in Japan in English, then you're exempt from having to take that Japanese exam. So it okay. is possible to apply for the research scholarship without taking an exam. Wow. Do you have a lot of the applicants that come through or that apply? Are they normally looking to do it in English or do you have a lot that come through wanting to do it in Japanese only? It's kind of a mix. A lot of times what you'll see is that those who don't have very strong Japanese that are you know, looking to get the postgraduate experience, they're, they're checking the in English only because they, they don't have the Japanese to handle it. But we do have a number that are looking to, to do it in Japanese. And I think it, it really, with the research scholarship, the exam matters, but what matters a lot more is their academic history, sure. their research plan, how feasible their research plan is, kind of the return on investment that the Japanese taxpayer might see. And is their research going to be relevant to Japan? Is there a reason why they need to be in Japan, why they need to be at a specific school, for instance, to do this research? Got it. And unlike JET, they do they get to choose what university they go to for this scholarship? Or are they placed somewhere? If we're focused on the research scholarship, uh -huh. the way it works is first they take the exam and the interview then we decide whether to recommend them for the scholarship. If they get our recommendation, then they pass the first round of screening. The second round is basically getting accepted to a university. So they would then, they can list up to three universities that they're going to reach out to. They reach out to two initially, and then if one of them turns it down, they can reach out to that third. But one of those schools has to issue them a letter of provisional acceptance that says that as long as they get granted the scholarship funds, they will be offered a spot at that school. Then everything kind of goes into a waiting. So they need to get that to us by September. Everything goes into a waiting pattern until closer to the end of the fiscal year in, in March. Um, usually it's right around Christmas that we find out whether people get the scholarship, but this time it went all the way into February before we were able to notify our, our recipient that, that she'd received the scholarship. Sometimes between late September and, and, and March, they'll find out whether or not they actually get the scholarship. That's a big window. <laughs> it is a big window. It is a big window. Yeah. And I'm then, sure they're super anxious. Yeah. You get you get the occasional email just checking in and it's like, I'll let you oh. know when I hear, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's in my experience, um, I've never known of someone and there might be a case out there, but I've never known of anyone who gets the consulate recommendation and provisional acceptance to a university and then doesn't ultimately get offered the scholarship. But I think that final round is just, it's the Ministry of Education and probably looking at their budget for the next year and sure. making sure that they can dole out all the scholarships that they're wanting to. Have you ever seen it where there's been people who get the recommendation from the consulate or the embassy, but then they didn't get one of their three options? And then unfortunately, they had to like that. That cuts it off at that point, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I I haven't, but there was a there have been a couple close calls where their like top two choices didn't take them, and then oh. they squeezed in on the third. Whew. So there have been a couple nail biters. I think it's kind of like maybe when you're applying to you know a university here, like you want to have a safety school. <laughs> so don't just list like Todai, <laughs> like go for some yeah. of the the more accessible schools as well. <laughs> so we we kind of talked about the timeline and everything like that. In qualifications, I know we spoke about this before the call started that, you know, there's links and we're going to put this all in our notes too. So everyone who's listening can find them on the website, but qualifications can be quite detailed in the application. Are there a few that are overarching for the research and and the other that maybe you want to call out that people need to know if they're a U.S. citizen or something like that? What is something that they have to know before they can uh, apply for this? So if you're applying through us, you need to be an American living within the region that you're of of the consulate that you're applying for. There are also age restrictions. Um, Okay. So it depends on the scholarship, but for instance, the research, I believe it's basically 34 roughly is, is kind of the cutoff after that. You're, you're not eligible for the scholarship. Damn. All right. Right. (laughs) (laughs) We're too old, Doug. (laughs) And those are some of the, I mean, that's, that's the main thing. You also can't be receiving additional scholarships, so it's supposed to just be the MEX scholarship. And I think those are kind of the overarching. Obviously, you need to have the academic credentials for whatever you're applying for. Sure. Um, so if it's the research scholarship, your undergraduate study and your lived experience or work experience needs to kind of match up with what you're wanting to go study. Um, you can't be a history major wanting to go into particle physics or something like that for a master's right. degree. right. So yeah, that's the, I would say the kind of the main overarching things. Okay. And so it sounds like there's a lot of prep work for this. So what is the ideal candidate for the MEX scholarship? What do future students have to really consider for themselves if they want to plan this out for their future? I guess a couple of things. First of all, if you're looking at the undergraduate scholarship, you're going to need to perform well on the tests. You also need to be quite mature and I would say have a pretty good drive for going to Japan and wanting to go study in Japan. With the undergraduate, I get a lot of folks who it's like, it, it seems that the reason why they're applying for the scholarship is because they would like a scholarship to go to college. If you would like a scholarship to go to college and you're able to get the next undergraduate scholarship, then I can just about guarantee you that you can get a scholarship to plenty of schools here in the U.S. Um, almost certainly, you know, your state schools probably Who knows? Maybe MIT, if you can pass that math exam. (laughs) I think you really do need to have that drive to go over to Japan and that willingness to kind of adapt to life over in Japan. Because full disclosure, I I never went to school in Japan. I only worked over there, worked at schools. Um, But it's a different system than here in the States. So you want to really educate yourself about that before you apply. Yeah. And it's a long-term commitment too. It's not like just go one year study abroad or anything like that. This is a full four. It's a full four. And it's, it's important to keep in mind that the degree that you're getting is going to be a Japanese degree. So if your goal is to come back here and work in the States with that Japanese undergraduate degree, you might run into some roadblocks when you're applying to jobs and they're looking at your diploma and they're like, what the heck is this? (laughs) So it's, you know, it's, I think it's better for people who have like, you know, a a really clear reason for why they want to go study over in, in Japan. For the research, the same kind of applies. Um, So if you're wanting to go do your research degree in Japan, we're looking for a good reason why you're wanting to go to Japan. If you're wanting to go get the degree in something that a lot of American universities excel at, then, you know, what's the point of going all the way over to Japan to get that particular degree? So for that, it's folks who can point to like Japan really excels in these fields, or there are certain professors at certain universities uh, that really align with my research interests. The degree that you're getting also needs to be kind of relevant. So if you get someone who's wanting to have the focus be something sociology related, focused on Southeast Asia, then the question kind of, you know, again, gets raised, like, why are you going to Japan to study about Southeast Asia? You could study about Southeast Asia in America if you're not going to physically be in the place that you're studying. No, that makes sense. That makes sense a lot. Yeah. So we mentioned earlier the uniqueness of the deadline structure and the timing of when those acceptances come in. But how does that timing line up with like, let's say the school year, do you have to start when the Japanese school year starts in April? Or is it something where you could possibly start in the fall and align your study? And maybe this is more for I guess for the four year, you kind of would probably have to do the April start date, right? I would have to double check. Typically, if you're doing the training program, 
the preliminary program, you're doing that until the April start date. And then you start it at the normal schedule. So you actually start in the late summer, early fall. If you're doing the direct placement, and I've not had anyone do the direct placement. I've only had the one guy who we managed to send on the undergraduate a couple of years ago. I'd have to double check, but I think you can start in September if you're going to a university that has a September start option. So some Japanese schools do have the ability to start kind of in September to more line up with North America. For the research, it's it's kind of the same thing. Really with the research scholarship, and again, it depends on the universities that you're going to, but a lot of them, when they provisionally accept you, they'll just provisionally accept you as a researcher, not as a graduate student. And so you'll start, you can start either in April or start in in September, October, but you would need to start as a researcher, work there for a little bit, and then take their actual entrance exams before they actually admit you in as a, as a graduate okay. student. So it, it really is like a, a full year almost that you have to plan ahead to apply for like these programs to start if you're starting in April, right? Because I guess right now yes. it's May. So you kind of need a full, well, it's not May yet. It's almost May. But you need that full year planning. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, a, you know, a lot of forward thinking. <laughs> and it's at least, it's at least a full year because right. even if you're starting in the fall, you're not starting until the fall of the following year. Right. So right now the scholarship that's open is the 2025 scholarship. So that means that the earliest you could start it is in April of 2025. The, although a lot of people will start it kind of in September, October of 2025. Yep. So okay, a year and a quarter. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I think it it sets up also kind of tricky for the undergraduate because you need to have your high school diploma by April of the year that you're applying for. So if you're a junior right now in high school and you're not going to graduate until next May, May of 2025, you're not eligible to apply for this scholarship because Uh. you won't have your degree in April like all the Japanese students do. So again, yeah, the guy that we, the one guy that we sent, he did apply as a high school student. Um, but he had taken enough uh, credits and everything that they let him graduate early. Like special circumstances or something like that? Yeah, it was, it was a weird thing. He was he was like, I guess, a, a big component of their highly competitive varsity basketball team. So they didn't want him to graduate in December because they wanted him for the whole basketball season. So they <laughs> set it up to where he like met his graduation requirements, as I remember, right when the basketball season ended. That's crazy. <laughs> so... For like average people that aren't on a basketball prodigy track, um, <laughs> would they almost have to like skip a year, uh, like take a year break between high school and college to do the undergraduate? Yeah, gotcha. basically. Okay. Yeah, which is another way that it's a little tricky because it's something in that case, it's something that you're applying for your senior year and you're applying for it in the spring of your senior year. Which means that if you, you know, presumably you would have applied for universities here in the U.S. kind of in the fall and winter of your senior year. So you'd already know about your, you know, what you're being offered by U.S. universities. Yeah. One of the reasons why we don't send many people on that undergraduate is that we just don't get many undergraduates who are willing to jump through those hoops. Yeah. A lot of times you see that the people who are willing to jump through those hoops are maybe the ones that didn't get the scholarships to the U.S. universities. But in a lot of cases, that means that they're not probably going to perform well enough on the exams yeah. to get the mix. Understandable. Understandable. And so similar to Jet, are there any tips that you can give to listeners who may be interested in the MEX scholarship? Like what they have to prepare for, like possible life in Japan? Like for Jet, you have people kind of helping you with living and uh, opening bank accounts and all this other stuff. Do students who do the MEX scholarship have that kind of support when they go over there? Or is that something that they have to like kind of account for themselves? I think it's situational. Mm. Through MEX, they're not getting that support as far as I, I know, just from conversations with the folks that we send over. And it's not part of the advertised scholarship package. So I think it would come down to kind of resource officers at the schools that they're going to. Gotcha. And every school is going to be a bit different. But I, yeah. I would assume that they're getting some assistance. But the way that that assistance presents itself would differ from one person's experience to the next. I wouldn't be surprised because a lot of times, at least when I did my study abroad, I studied in the Department of Comparative Culture, I think is what it was called at Sophia when I was there. And that was like all their English only classes, like the English only division basically of the school. And they had a separate department that kind of handled the foreign students that were coming in. Mm -hmm. They had packets, they would say, hey, here are dormitory options and things like that. 
So I'm sure they probably have something like that at many universities, especially if they have an English only department, because if they're doing that, they're probably attracting international students as well as domestic. Mm -hmm. It was something that was helpful. They helped facilitate, you know, at least living situation. I think I'm thinking back, I had to do my phone and my bank account on my own, or at least someone from school came and helped me like one of my friends, not like an administrator or anything like that or a staff. So yeah, I think, I mean, anyone who's applying to go live over in Japan ideally is independent minded. They're willing to, you know, right. embrace the challenges that come to getting yourself set up over there. I would say go expecting as, as little hand holding as possible. And then, you know, you may be pleasantly surprised with the amount of assistance that you get, but it may come down to you, Doug, like, like you were saying, you think with your, your phone and stuff, if you aren't able to sort it out yourself, then being able to go up and ask, you know, a friend for assistance. Yeah. Cause the phone thing, I definitely, now that I'm talking about it, I remember I had a, about a $200 phone bill my first month because I didn't realize what I signed up for. <laughs> and went over the data package, like limit, like way, to, like way, way a lot. You know, I was texting and emailing and all this stuff. I was going crazy because my phone had all this cool gadgetry on it that we didn't have in the U.S. And I was all excited. And then, yep, nope, two hundred, two hundred dollars later, uh, no, nope, never, I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, and for the listeners, this was pre iPhone, like where, oh yeah, <laughs> dinosaur age. <laughs> it was flip phones, and it had like a, a TV, like you had like yeah, a, I had a TV those. on it. <laughs> I had one of those. I thought I was so advanced, and then like I know. That that year, the iPhone came out in America, and so everyone back in America suddenly got streaming the before streaming. Yeah. <laughs> so we talked about a lot of stuff, and, and you've given us so much information. But like, do you think there's one particular pain point for applicants? And maybe this is the the one with the timing of like the application for like the undergrads. Like that's the biggest pain point is like determining do I want to put a year off from like when I graduate high school and take this year gap year basically, or you know, is, is there another like? Thing that people find in the application itself that like a lot of applicants find as a pain point? Well, I guess the biggest pain point is just the length of the, the selection process okay, and the uncertainty that that brings. So there's plenty of chances that you'll get to quickly be informed that you, you weren't successful. But if you are a successful applicant, it is a long waiting period during which time I, I remember our undergraduate, it was like, he was messaging me like, Hey, what's going on? Like I'm I'm throwing in some applications to universities here in the States, just in case. And, you know, the same, the uh, research applicant this year, she was started to ask me, like, should I start applying to other graduate schools just in case this doesn't work out? So there is that kind of length of uncertainty. I think it, it sets up best for someone who is a looking at the research realm for someone who really knows what they want to do, knows where they want to go in Japan, knows why they want to go there that it really fits in with their future ambitions. Sometimes, and I love it when it's someone who already has connections with universities in Japan through their professors, their advisors, or you know, study abroad or something like that. So they've got a, a fairly clear idea of why they want to go. And for people in like STEM fields and stuff, maybe they're working in a lab already. So they've got a job. This is what they're trying for. Maybe in a year, year and a half, This is if they're successful, this is what they're going to do. And if not, then they'll apply to, to different graduate schools. So yeah, I think you need to be flexible and you need to have kind of that long view um, yeah. on your career because because of the timeline. Well, that, that kind of brings us to our end point. I mean, this is great. And this answered a lot of the questions that we had. And I know maybe a lot of other people out there too. I know they, your JET episodes have been some of our top performing episodes because I think so many people are out there wanting to know about these programs that are available to get to Japan and study mm -hmm. or work in Japan. So this is something that I know that we, I didn't really know much about personally, and I have no experience with it, but I knew that you would have great insights. So that's why we brought you back on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. Before we wrap up, did you have any other like reminders or things that you wanted to call out to? I know we mentioned the deadline and, and we're going to have those links out there for the resources for the different next applications, but is there anything else that you maybe wanted to call out? I've kind of said this already, but for those that are looking at the undergraduate, really think it through and don't approach it as though it's a really easy way to get a free undergraduate degree because there are a bunch of hoops and it that exam in particular is quite tricky. So it, it is something that's possible, but it, it's definitely a reach kind of thing. For folks who are looking at the, uh, the research, I think it is a lot more approachable. So we send somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple dozen Americans on the research scholarship each year, whereas maybe we send one to three on the undergraduate. By we, I mean the United States, not the Nashville Consulate. 
for the research, if it's something that you're interested in, look into it. And if you can put together a good research plan and you can come in with a good message about why you think you would be a good fit for the scholarship, um, it, it's definitely, definitely approachable. It's definitely worth your time to go for it. So I really encourage uh, particularly the research folks to, to look into it. If they, Again, if they've got that strong reason for wanting to go to Japan for their master's or PhD. Awesome. Good deal. All right, Ty. Well, thanks again. We appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a great day, guys. All right, well, there you have it. Straight from the mouth of a MEX coordinator. But as Ty said, he personally did not pursue educational opportunities via MEX in Japan. But our next guest did. William Archambault, or as I know him, Willie, traversed the MEX application cycle in 2021 at the height of the pandemic, which added some extra layers to the already cumbersome application process. Willie joins us to discuss his lived experiences both leading up to and during his still ongoing MEX research, provides some candid insight and advice for prospective MEX scholars, and discusses how he turned a lifelong passion into a plan for his MEX application. Let's go. All right, so part two of our MEX conversation. Earlier, we spoke with Ty from the consulate in Nashville. But this time, we're actually going to speak with a current MEX participant on a research MEX program. So we have with us Willie Archambault from New Orleans, but currently in Osaka. So hey, Willie, how you doing? Good, good. How you doing? Great, man. Great. And also, welcome back to the podcast because you were officially on an episode in season one me, with me and Nigel. We were talking about like a preview of an episode that actually never happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had done like a very short snippet of a thing. Yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah. It's it was been like a minute. A that was what, like two or three years ago? <laughs> actually, yeah, I think it was three years ago. Jeez and peas, man. It's flown by, huh? <laughs> so congrats on how far y'all have come since then. <laughs> it's been it's been a lot of work. <laughs> but no, well, welcome back to the podcast. But a lot has changed since we last talked. I think you had already been accepted onto Max at that point, right? No, you were applying for it maybe at the time when we talked. If you tell me the year, I could tell you. Was 2021, it 2021? Maybe in the late spring, early summer. Yeah, if it was during that period, that was when I was applying for Max. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So you weren't accepted yet. You were in the process of putting together all the pieces. And we're going to touch on that in a second. But <laughs> before we get into all that, give me a quick Cliff Notes version of your relationship with Japan. You know, like where it began and how did it lead to you eventually deciding to apply for the MEX scholarship program? Like most Americans my age, I'm 29. I was exposed to Japan through a lot of popular culture of that era, you know, whether it be anime, games, and things like that. But I was also very much exposed to Japan via the musicians who would come and perform in New Orleans. So for instance, people like Yoshio Toyama would come and play Louis Armstrong's music in New Orleans all the time. So since I was a kid, I've known that New Orleans and Japan have very strong bonds, actually. And then with regards to being in Japan as an actual place, I had participated in the UNO Japan Study Abroad program back in 2016, which was a five-week program at Doshisha University in Kyoto. That's During Jen's that baby. Time, well, now it's Jen's baby. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't at right. that time. I don't know about that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, it was all Mary Hicks. Uh, shout out Mary Hicks. Wouldn't be yeah. here if it wasn't for her. <laughs> I think maybe Mary listens. If Mary, if you listen, comment on one of our posts on social media. We'll know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, during that time, I got to see some more of those New Orleans-Japan connections from the opposite side, being in Japan instead of in the United States. When I returned to New Orleans then, I did an undergraduate honors thesis specifically focusing on that in regards to music. A uh, big component of that was interviewing Japanese immigrant musicians in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, I did the JET program for a year. I was an assistant language teacher in Nishinomaki, Miyagi Prefecture. Great experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then I was a freelance music journalist, and I would sometimes write pieces for the Japan Times. Okay. So I think that kind of brings everything roughly up to speed. <laughs> yeah. And there, there you go. Like I said, cliff notes. <laughs> and by the way, send me a couple of your articles if you have some for Japan Times. I'll happy to put them into our show notes. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So why did you decide on Max? So the reason I ultimately decided to do Mext was, I guess I'd say there were two reasons. One being, of course, that 
Um, this research I'm currently conducting is something that I've been doing essentially since 2016. So it was a logical continuation of that. Mm-hmm. And then I would say the other reason I ultimately decided to do Mext was that I applied in 2021. And now for those of you who may not remember, that was peak pandemic. Yeah, You know, everything kind of fell apart. And so as a freelance music journalist, I was considering other avenues through which I could pursue my future. And next seemed like a really good option to be able to do this research and to be able to do it with the approval of the Japanese government as well. Yeah. So your focus for those studies would be like music and and the relationship between New Orleans and Japan? Yeah, so I'm in the musicology department at Osaka University. I am currently a graduate student. Um, I had done one year prior as a research student on the MEX scholarship. And my research focus is the musical connections between New Orleans and Japan, particularly focused on New Orleans style musicians within Japan. Got it. How they got kind it, of it. authenticate their work, build community, yada, yada, sure. yada. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. So do you remember anything along the way with your application process? Now, again, you said this was peak pandemic. So things were a little weird with correspondence and even not even knowing when you'd be able to go to Japan, even if you were accepted, because at that point, and I don't know if people remember, I know Amy remembers because of Jet and how she was kind of in limbo for a while, right? So so for reference, Doug is referencing my girlfriend, Amy, who (laughs) uh, essentially got held back a year to do the Jet program because of the pandemic. Right, right, right. Thank you for clarifying on that. <laughs> it was a tough time in general because the, the, a lot of things were just unknown. And it was just a very unsure time of like, you're applying, but you really don't know when this is going to happen. So were there any other things that were particularly stressful about that application process? Or maybe something that you considered a pain point, maybe something specifically with the application itself? Yeah, um, one of the things that actually was surprisingly stressful about it was their insistence that my letters of recommendation have actual inked signatures instead of electronic signatures. Oh, really? So I had initially submitted them with electronic signatures, which was okay at that exact moment, but they needed me to then get versions that actually had real signatures. And so one of my signatures was from the professor who had advised my undergrad thesis. He was in France at the time. Oh, and so God. he actually had to mail my letter of recommendation from France to Nashville. Bless his soul that he actually <laughs> did it. Because if he hadn't done that, I would have been out of luck, essentially. Yeah, yeah. It's one You miss one little thing with any kind of application when it comes to these Japan programs, and you're done. And you just said the key thing, actually, because you're also a JET program alum. And I feel like the application process was very similar in the regards of the biggest stressors, honestly, just spend a lot of time on your application. Read it at least two more times than you think you need to read it, because all they have to go off of is your written word. And so that's what they're going to judge you off of when you send that in. Yeah. Yeah. So part of your application included a study plan or your research plan, right? Mm -hmm, Was mm -hmm. that, was that something that you kind of, I'm sure at that point you probably thought a lot about it. So was it really hard to put that down on paper and kind of convey your thoughts? I think it was a little difficult to think about how I would convey it with the Japanese government as my audience, because when you're writing something like that, you always have to keep in mind who your audience is. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had to think long and hard about that. And then another part that was actually a bit of a stressor, not a huge stressor, but a little bit, was that they do ask you, if possible, to, in addition to English, write it in Japanese as well, which I did do. You know, it wasn't the most beautiful thing I've ever written, but it was something that I did do. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So another thing Ty mentioned when we talked to him earlier Mm -hmm. He mentioned the wait time between the Mm -hmm. point when you send in your application and get your recommendation, official recommendation from the consulate. And then you go through the process of like the schools accepting you. And then it's just kind of a sit and wait period. How long did you have to wait before you were officially accepted? Oh, my gosh. Well, it's it's (laughs) it's a little vague because it was also uh, COVID times. So I don't want to speak so much as a definitive statement for what it is like now. But I can I can walk you through a bit of what it was like for me. 
Okay. Um, I had applied in June of 2021. I believe I had my interview that same month. And then I think they got back to me. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, um, I was officially accepted, finally, 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 after being unofficially accepted through the Nashville consulate. The final thing happened in February of 2022. Yeah, it's a long that time, was, huh? Yeah. And <laughs> then um, in addition to that, with it being peak pandemic and visas and things like that, the border's still being kind of iffy. I was supposed to be there in April. I didn't get to go until May. <laughs> right. So if I'm remembering right, 2022... Mm -hmm. They were just starting to let students in, but in like waves, right? It was like a limit, yeah. a cap as mm -hmm. to how many people can come in under that visa and for like, you know, every, I don't know, is it three weeks or a month or something like that. And they kept raising the cap incrementally and before they eventually just, uh, you know, ripped open the, the borders once again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you, so you were impacted by that cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, the borders were very, very weird back at that time. It's, yeah, it's yeah, nice that you, things are a lot more relaxed now. <laughs> I know, right? I know. So what resources were out there that helped you when you were preparing your application? Did you did you just kind of go off of what was specifically on like the consulates, like guidelines and, you know, things there? Or were there any other additional resources you found along the way that really provided some good direction for your application? I would say that the internet is your best friend. Um, all the resources I would have looked at were, you know, three years ago almost and now. Yeah. Um, honestly, just Googling what people have to say and what they've been through is probably the best thing you can do. Just try to find as much information as you can. If you can talk to people who have been through the experience, I think that's also a really good thing to do. So for yeah. instance, uh, one of the people I had gotten to speak to, I believe was a Mext scholarship alum from like the nineties. So obviously there's quite a bit of a gap there generation wise, but it's still good information to have. Yeah, for sure. When you selected your schools, you know, at what point did you settle in and say, these are the schools I want to go to? Like when you submitted your application, you had to specify, I think it's three, right? Yeah. Was Osaka University your first one? Or did you kind of have like, you know, a list that you had to work your way down through? So I'll be honest with you. Um, I remember two of my three choices. I don't remember the third one. My two top two choices were Waseda University in Tokyo. Uh -huh. And then Osaka University, obviously in Osaka. Um, and I was actually going back and forth between which one I was going to end up at for quite a minute there. Waseda University actually has some direct ties to my research theme with them having the New okay. Orleans Jazz Club there. But Osaka University, the person who is now my current advisor, had a really rich, deep connection with New Orleans music. Whereas wow. if I was at Waseda University, I would have been working with somebody whose focus was specifically just jazz. And gotcha. so it wound up just being that my advisor at Osaka University seemed like he would be a much better fit for what I was trying to do. Okay. So let's say you put mm -hmm. these down on your application. Do you apply mm -hmm. to all three of them at the same time and you just kind of wait for like an acceptance from them? How does that process work? Oh my or do you Lord. do one now at that, a time? You do one at a time. Yeah. Because okay. I, if I remember correct, I don't think you're supposed to spam like all three of them at once. Oh, okay. Um, I believe that the reason I had moved on, because I had been talking about uh, Waseda and Osaka University, and part of the complications with Waseda University was just uh, that my the advisor there was busy with some other things. And so he wasn't quite getting back to me on the timeline that I would have needed for Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, all the classes that you take, are they in English only, or do you have some that are in Japanese? It's more like all of my classes are in Japanese. And if I'm lucky, every once in a while, I get a class that's in English. Okay. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I, um, I, I wasn't sure. Okay. So for reference, I had done one year as a research student specifically, and then I tested into Osaka University through like their actual musicology department. And there are a decent number of international students in our small department. But it's not really geared towards people from English speaking countries. Okay. So I think I'm the only native English speaker in our whole department. There's one other European woman, and then there's uh, some other students from other parts of Asia as well. 
Okay. So everything's okay. in Japanese. <laughs> okay. That's got to be surreal, like studying like New Orleans music and like, like themes about New Orleans music in Japanese <laughs> as opposed mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, in English. That's kind of cool. Well, that's exactly why I wanted to pursue Mext and uh, be able to do this research over here, though, is because I had done a reasonable amount of research on it in New Orleans. But really, if you're engaging in this phenomenon from just New Orleans with just English language resources, you're not quite getting the full picture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It makes total sense. And actually, that's another thing Ty mentioned, too, is that when you're applying, you really need to emphasize why you need to be in Japan to do this and why you just don't can't just do this wherever your home is, you know? So that was another thing that he said, you know, make it clear that there is a reason you need to go to a Japanese master's program to research this information. Yeah, exactly. It's very important to remember that you are applying through the Japanese government and yeah. that they ultimately have a slight bias towards they want to know like, well, why should we be giving you money? Right, right. Why is this relevant to us? <laughs> you know, if it's it's not like applying for a regular scholarship in the United States where it's like, oh, I've got this good idea. And it's like, yeah, that's good. But how does it actually pertain to Japan? <laughs> right. And how does it benefit us? Like, what is our what is our ROI going to be on this? <laughs> <laughs> Cultural ROI, but ROI nonetheless. Mm-hmm. So what's life been like since starting the program? Like you said, you went over initially as a research student, right? And then you mm-hmm. transitioned into your department that you're currently with. And and is that I'm assuming that's still on the Mex scholarship like spectrum, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm still on the, I'm still receiving the Mex scholarship. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I would not be able to afford it if it was not. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet, I bet, I bet. <laughs> so life's been good over there. It's been fun. Yeah, life's been fun. I will say um, doing grad school in Japan is definitely a very serious thing, especially when all my classes are in Japanese. You know, yeah. it's, it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever undertaken in my life. But I will say it's also very rewarding to get the opportunity to do these types of things that not many people get the opportunity to do. Yeah, I'm sure there's so a lot of like music scholars in New Orleans that would love to be in your situation and be able to find and dig out this information that you're finding, you know, from a different perspective. Oh, yeah. I mean, I get to interact with people who have been musicians, Japanese musicians, who have had honorary citizenship of New Orleans since the 1960s. Yeah. You know, and those are people who are now so old that they're not going back to New Orleans at this stage in their life. So, yeah, for from a research perspective, it's a great opportunity. So for school wise, though, like what was your schedule like? Was it like going to a classroom setting, you know, multiple times a week? Or was it more of like kind of independent study initially? And then now that you're enrolled in a like official department where it's like you're doing classes like, you know, like you said before the call, was it initially like kind of independent study or was it more of a structured format? So when I came over as a research student, I was auditing my advisor's classes while also doing my own research aside from that. And so I can't remember if that was one or two days a week, I would be auditing his classes. And then the rest of the time I would be out doing either field work or working in the research lab, really just, you know, essentially treating it like a nine to five job, you know, grinding as much as I could actually, actually even more than a nine to five job. Now that I think about <laughs> going to actual events and things like that outside of that on the weekends and whatnot. Yeah. You keep yourself pretty busy. I, I'll follow you on Instagram and so in Facebook. <laughs> I see, I see you going to all these shows and meeting all these crazy people, man. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But so, uh, I mean, I just, I just treated it like a nine to five job and I still do. Um, I go to Japanese tutors twice a week during the night, you know, so it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, sure. it's good. Like you said, it's rewarding, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And the the most important thing is it's something you really want to do and you're passionate about. So I'm sure it makes it a lot easier and keeps you on track. Oh, yeah, exactly. Is, is This is the kind of stuff that like, I think it's nice that they're giving me money to do it. But frankly, being a nerd, there's a certain part of me that would be doing a certain degree of this regardless. Like when right. I was on the JET program, I was still traveling to go and interact with Japanese uh, musicians who did New Orleans style music to learn more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So did you have a lot of connections that you reconnected with once you came back on the MEX program uh, at, at Osaka University? Did you reconnect with some of those people you met during JET? Oh, yeah, yeah, most certainly. Um, in fact, uh, there's a longstanding brass band in Osaka named Blitz and Squash Brass Band, who, yeah, I know from back when I had been a JET participant. Oh, cool. I also uh, got to know people in Matsue, our sister city, 
while I was a Jet participant and have since gotten to reconnect with them as well. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So before we wrap everything up, do you have any advice for people who are aspiring to apply for this program and become maybe one of the next wave of MEC scholars? I mean, that the deadline for application is May 24th. So we got about, from the date of recording, about a month. <laughs> when this release is maybe two or three weeks. I don't know exactly yet. But, <laughs> but um, do you have any advice for those that are maybe working their way through their application and stumble across this podcast episode and listen and, listening to your story? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is really do just treat the application seriously. You know, give it more reviews than you think you need to. If you can have some other people look at it, I think that's also a good idea. That's a big point. I'm trying to think of what else. I know there are other things in my head, but there's something <laughs> more. Oh, yeah. Actually, another really big thing, too, is to remember that if you're applying through a consulate, like, say, the Nashville consulate, you know, I think the way it works is in theory, they have like one slot per year. And essentially, mm -hmm. you're kind of competing with whoever the other people are applying for through that consulate. So depending on the year, you know, if there's a lot of applicants, that could be a lot of competition. If there aren't that many applicants, that could be, you know, not as stiff a competition. Could be favorable for you, right? Yeah. And so just, just think about that as well. Not only are you trying to say, hey, I've got this idea. Hey, this thing I'm uh, passionate about. But also remember, there are other applicants also trying to bring things to the table too, that you also have to kind of say, well, they're saying this, but also I can do this. <laughs> yeah. That actually makes me think of a question. If you are mm -hmm. not able to get the MEX scholarship, you know, let's say this year, mm -hmm. do you know if you can apply that you can keep applying every year or is there like a wait period? I know with Jet, like you can apply every year, but if you would get accepted, but then turn it down after a certain point, you can't apply for like five years. I don't know I if there's feel, anything like this. Yeah, that would be a question for Ty, yeah. but I feel like it's probably very similar in the extent of, I highly doubt that they would say, oh, you can't try again. Yeah. But yeah, if you do somehow get the ball and then fumble it, that might be a different story. <laughs> right, right, right. And I'm sure if you try again, you may want to relook at your plan of action or your uh, just your application as a whole and review it and say, okay, what did I do wrong? And maybe you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe it was just competitive that year. So maybe yeah. you had a lot of stuff, right? So, yeah. Well, and also, and I think it was the same with, with knowing people who have applied for the JEP program is also if you do take a year to like resubmit, just think about like in that year's time, what can you do to better position yourself for this opportunity? Yeah. You know, don't just let that be a static year where you just come back again with an application. It's the exact same thing that you copied and pasted. Right. Build your resume more. Yeah. Yeah. But, but seriously, going back to what I was saying, seriously, just just cross your T's, dot your I's, because, you know, if all they've got to take you on is what you've written, typos and things like that really do look glaring. Yeah, just make sure nothing's missing and it's in the mm -hmm. order that they ask it. And because I, I think oh, yes. even Ty mentioned yes. this. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Ty mentioned like it's not like the JET application now, which went digital. The Mac stuff is very much physical paper you have to mail in. Even now, past pandemics, I know maybe things had changed possibly, but no, not with this. So just make sure everything's there in that folder. And if you have to overnight it to make sure that it gets there in time, do it. It's worth it. I did that yeah. with my jet application back in the day. So yeah, I don't want to think on how, how much I've spent on shipping to the Nashville concert. But <laughs> it's gotten me opportunities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This is great. Maybe if people are interested or maybe have questions for you about Max and want to reach out, is there any way that they can contact you or find you on social media? Sure. Yeah. I mean, on social media, I guess Instagram is probably the easiest. Uh, I'm W-W-A-R-C-H-A-M-B. And if you're trying to email me, it's just that at Gmail. Cool. Otherwise, I'm not a social media guru, so not an influencer. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't either. <laughs> well yeah no i mean just you know try your best to get an opportunity i, I support anybody who's trying to pursue it <laughs> yeah man well thank you so much for joining us dude this is great and it's always good to catch up and whenever i get my ass down to osaka i'll hit you up it may not be for a while but it, i'll definitely hit you up yeah well yeah because you always hit me up going like oh i'm in tokyo and i'm like man do you know well, do if you, you know, that's Waseda, a night bus for me if you were at Waseda, it would be a lot easier <laughs> <laughs> I actually used to live around Waseda. I could tell you all the cool spots around there. <laughs> <laughs>
See, but the thing I like about Osaka is the whole place is the cool spot. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Osaka's pretty dope. All right, dude. Well, thank you so much. It's been great catching up. And I, I think a lot of our listeners will find this very helpful with their application process. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I have a bit of diarrhea <laughs> of the mouth. <laughs> All right, dude. Talk to you later. Yeah, of course. And that's it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning into the Crew of Japan podcast. A huge thank you to both of our guests, Ty Ebel of the Consulate General of Japan in Nashville, who is always incredibly supportive not only of this podcast and us, but anyone showing interest in these Japanese government initiatives like the JET program or the Mex Scholarship programs. A big thank you to William Archambault, or Willie, current Mex Scholar in Osaka. The New Orleans Japan Music Connection is something that has been on this podcast radar since season one. But hopefully, one day we'll be able to snag Willie for another episode to discuss those ties even further, especially since he's obtained so much more knowledge in studying in Japan. Can't wait to pick his brain. Don't forget the Nashville consulate. Now, it may be different for wherever you may be applying through, but the Nashville consulate's deadline for the MEX applications is May 24th, 2024. So don't forget that is creeping up less than three weeks away. Check out the show notes for all pertinent links and information about the MEX scholarship programs that we discussed throughout both of our conversations. We'll have all of that, as well as past episodes about JET featuring Ty, linked out in our show notes. Is the MEX scholarship program on your radar? Which program is the best fit for you? Share with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, X, TikTok, LinkedIn, Blue Sky, YouTube, and wherever else you may find us at Crew of Japan Podcast. That's K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. While you're there, give us a comment, follow, like, share, retweet, whatever floats your boat. Let us know how you're enjoying the podcast. Or perhaps you might like to share your feedback in a more private setting. Send us an email at crewofjapanpodcast at gmail.com. That's K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. We'd really love to hear your thoughts and feedback. And speaking of feedback, if you're enjoying what you're listening to right now or the rest of the season or previous seasons, please feel free to leave us a five-star rating and or review on your favorite podcast streaming app. Every single one of those five-star ratings and reviews helps others interested in Japan and this kind of content find the podcast. Or hey, just, you know, share us with a friend. Let them know about us. I'm 100% sincere when I say that any and all support is incredibly appreciated by the crew. But that's it for today. Until next time. Looking to start your own podcast? and don't know what platform to use? Tell me about it. When we started the Crew of Japan podcast, we tried a bunch of the big name recording platforms, but always came back to the one we're still currently using to this day, Zencaster. Zencaster is now the all-in-one solution making podcasting easy. In addition to its high audio and video quality for podcast production, Zencaster provides a full suite of production tools to record, produce, and publish studio quality content from the comfort of your home. Just log in through your browser and start recording. It's that simple. For us, we simply send out links to our guests and they join the lobby. But before you know it, it's all done and you have your studio quality audio and up to 4K video right there ready for you right when you finish. The best part is having their multi-layered backups to ensure that your recordings are in the highest quality, regardless of anyone's internet connection stability. With Zencaster's all-in-one podcasting platform, you can create your podcasts in one place and distribute to all the major destinations. It's really that easy. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use our code Crew of Japan, K R E W E O F J A P A N, and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. We want you to have the same easy experiences we do for all of our podcasting and content needs. It's your time to share your story.